And we're back. Welcome back, Washington Buckons fans, uh, to another episode of the podcast. And this one's going to be pretty sweet for me in particular. And I think you guys are really going to like this one as well. Um, we've stepped outside of the realm of football several times with different sports, but I've never brought you guys really into the world of mixed martial arts, especially mixed martial arts in other countries because they do things a whole lot differently than we do here. Coach and I have talked about that many times about the mentality of a lot of Americans as opposed to uh, the foreigners in the fight game. And I think that uh, hearing some of the coaches' stories are going to be pretty eye-opening for you guys. So sit back and enjoy. Coach Dorian Price, welcome to the podcast, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, no, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. This is uh, Cooper. What do you got for him, dude? I know you got a question queued up. You've been thinking about it for a while. I just, I just feel like so. For those who are watching the podcast today, Drake's camera isn't working for some reason. So he is, he is his, uh, his better half today. It's just Kaylee on the screen, and I think it might be because Dorian probably had to deal with looking at your ugly face so much <laughs> uh, that that the the technology just was trying to help him out today. So. No, I'm just, I'm super excited to have you on Dorian. This podcast, I don't know how much Drake has told you about it. Um, it is sort of based on the, uh, the genetics of, you know, we are kind of underrated under, uh, recruited guys who, who ended up at a, a division one football program and, mm -hmm. um, kind of embodied a, a, a crazy work ethic, um, a great mentality to, to be better and be disciplined and, and just work through adversity and, I feel like a lot of that, and that's why Drake is so interested in the fight game in the first place, a, a lot of that transfers over to MMA and, and fighting in general. So I'm just, I'm just extremely excited to hear your story and, uh, and appreciative that you're here. Um, I, I'd love to know, like, going all the way back, like, when was the first time that fighting was ever a thing for you? Like, did, was it something you wanted to get into very early on or was it something that happened later in life or how did that come about? Um, well, martial arts was always like around, um, I guess, um, I'm, I'm 46 now. So when I was younger, we had, you know, the Saturday used to be a thing called Kung Fu theater. You used to have the old Kung Fu, uh, flicks on and then you had the Wu-Tang Clan. And, uh, so, martial arts and even our 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 uh our action heroes or i should say my action heroes of the day were guys like uh chuck norris hell yeah bruce lee you know the guys that they were manly men and they they were all doing karate or some sort of martial arts and that's what kind of got me uh got got me uh interested in it but growing up i was playing basketball and doing other things it wasn't until i turned uh I think 18, I started, uh, I ended up in Virginia Beach and uh, was looking through, they used to have uh, these magazines back in the day called Black Belt Magazines. And in the back, they used to have these uh, uh, videos called Panther Videos, the VHS days and the Panther Videos. And uh, inside I saw a video of this guy, cause I had wanted to become a Navy SEAL. And so I saw mm. one of this guy that was a SEAL and uh, he had cool videos, and then also if you kept flipping through the Panther, uh, excuse me, through the Black Belt magazine, they would have the list of the states, and in the states they would have the various uh, uh, gems or whatever. And it just so happened that the same seal, uh, 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 call him Mister C. He was a uh, 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 Virginia has a very large naval installation, and they have uh, the East Coast SEAL team station there in uh, mm -hmm. Little Creek, amphibious base. So I just happened to walk. I saw that his gym was in Virginia Beach, and I was like. I was on the other side of the water, uh, which is called Hampton Roads. And I was like, man, this isn't far. So I just started driving down and walked into the gym. And the guy became like a mentor. And there were a lot of SEALs there. There was regular people as well. But uh, that really shaped my mentality. And uh, fought a couple times there. Um, this is back in the, the 90s where there was no athletic commission. So you pretty much just, uh, you know, you showed up and you, and, and you fought. Um, and, uh, yeah, then after that, uh, uh, uh I did a, uh, my first stint in, uh, in Thailand. You, uh, going all the way back to the very beginning of that, you said you're 46, you look better than most 30 year olds. So that's, I uh, appreciate it. Inside that's I'm probably 80, <laughs> 80. Um, yeah, the, so 
So coach, explain your first stint in Thailand. So, um, you know, you've, you've been, in, you've been in martial arts a couple of years and you go over there, explain the eye opening experience that that was. Um, it was, it was, it was very, uh, uh, very, very, uh, interesting. Um, cause I've seen your videos on Instagram of you taking your, your followers through what it was like there. You've got videos oh, okay. of that the trenches. Been, that would have been a long-term stint. So that would have been 2009 on up until 2020. So that's okay. what you're talking about. Yeah. First stint was the golden era. Um, and it was pretty interesting. It was the golden era of, of Thai boxing, which has seen us like the legendary fighters was a lot harder. But I think you're talking about the second step where I had all those uh, those fun videos. Yeah, of how, how where you were staying, where you were going to the bathroom, showering at the what what the living situation looked like. Um, well, the different camps were different, so um, I, I always wanted to search out the knowledge, and um, I was really had the opportunity because I was one of the first Americans over there, and a lot of the camps, you know, they uh, didn't really have too many foreigners and definitely not American. So I became the first foreigner and the first American at a lot of, uh, a lot of camps. And, um, some of the conditions were you just live like I, for one camp that I went to that always, uh, uh, close to my heart is a camp called Sitmo Chai, a very famous camp. And one of the things where they would, uh, they would have me sleeping on the floor so, you know, a lot of times it's very communal. So it's like a family, almost like a Spartan-like environment when you're in, when you think of a Thai boxing camp, very regimented. So the most camps you, just to give you kind of a layout, you, you know, you live in the camp, every camp has different living situations, but pretty much you're in a room. Sometimes you might have, if you're lucky, you got some bunk beds set up. If not, you're, you know, you're on the floor with just mattresses stuffed on the floor, uh, never air con in the room. So it's a, a fan. Um, and the way it runs down is pretty much now mind you, every camp will be slightly different, but it's pretty much this is what it's kind of like. You wake up about six o'clock in the morning, brush your teeth, throw some water in your face, whatever you got to do. Six thirty, you're on the road, you do your 10K run, which I think equates to about seven miles. Come back. You'll probably train maybe two hours of actual training after the run, then you jump your rope for 30 minutes. Then you do about two hours in the morning. Now, mind you, every camp is somewhat different. You'll, you'll eat, shower. Uh, they want you to be off of your feet. You know, you don't have to be asleep, but you go in the room. Maybe you can get up, you get up at maybe noon or something. Uh, there's always a rice cooker or, or, or one of the boys in the camp. They, they, you know, they might know how to cook. So they might cook up a little food. So, you, you know, you can eat your third meal or something, or excuse me, second. The 3 30, 4 o'clock, depending on the heat of the day. You'll get out, you'll go run again. This time you're running 6K, which I think equates to three miles. I'm not too sure, but you'll run your 6K. You'll come back, and the afternoon session will be probably about four hours. And you'll do that uh, six days a week. So you'll do it twice on Saturday as well. So your only off day is technically is, is Sunday, and it runs like that. Um, How but, many calories are you eating on these days? Um. I don't know. We don't, we don't count calories. I mean, I was able to get two, two, uh, two meals a day was sufficient enough for me. Um, then I can get, uh, some fruit. There's always, uh, some of the camps, you know, they had, uh, coconuts around. So you could just go out there and knock a coconut off the tree and, you know, eat that, um, <laughs> or just, just get some, get some fruit. Um, uh, but this yeah, is, I never, this is fucking calories. wild. I, I never, never counted the, the, the calories. That's um, insane. You're running almost 10 miles a day and have yeah. five, six hours of mat time or like, what, I, I guess seven, depend on, depend on the camp. So in the morning you might do two, some camps are a little harder, maybe you do three hours of training. So it's anywhere between, let's just say six to seven hours a day, six days a week. And eating two meals a day. <laughs> That's insane. Mm -hmm. Eating two meals a day. Yeah. And, and you can eat your rice and stuff. That's and did you ever feel run down or burnt out of that? Um, me personally, I did not because uh, I just stopped. I don't. I didn't think about it. Um, I just it became part of my my routine to the point where even when I retired, 
I remember I would get up, and that's another story in itself. I used to just get up because uh, I was still living in camp from retirement. I would get up and then start running. And then halfway through, I would just be like, what the fuck? Wait a minute. I'm retired. I don't have to. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, hold would, on a second. I don't yeah, do this anymore. What am I doing? I would walk back to the camp and I used to get like a uh, rescue. Like there are a lot of street dogs. So I would try and like keep bringing street dogs back to the camp. And uh, eventually they had to tell me like, look, you got to stop bringing these dogs back. So I would just come back and play with the street through with, with what I call gym dogs. There was like 50 of them. And I wasn't like, I was too lazy to name them. So I was just like gym dog one, gym dog two. I just give them random names. <laughs> when did you retire, Dorian? I retired at 40. I think 40 was my last fight. Yeah. Wow. And you felt you still felt good at 40. Um or no. Fight fighting wise? Yeah. I, I I felt like I could I could do it. What got to me was um when I just realized I was just that's when I probably started feeling sort of burnt out because I never thought, I never thought about anything. I never thought about the train or anything. And then the day I started thinking about like, Oh shit, I got to make the run or I was like, Oh man, it's the beginning of the end. Then. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, what, what, I have another question is, was there a language barrier over there or did they know English? There's always somebody could speak some, Eng some English, but, um, uh, it wasn't too much. And the language of martial arts isn't really, it's pretty universal. It's like, sure. hey, punch this motherfucker in the face. This would have kicked his ass and, you know, do this and that. And, you know, you eventually figure it out. That that makes sense. Uh. <laughs> Did you have any run? I, I, you know, I talked to a few guys that um, uh, served in the armed forces and spent some time over there. And mm -hmm. I, I've heard, did, did you spend any time like in the nightlife area out there? I've heard, uh, you gotta be super careful about some of the maybe ladies that you're talking to over there. Oh, uh, lady boys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you know you know the concept? Funny story. Do you do you know why they uh, become lady boys? No, I have no idea. Because in Thailand, they think uh, you lose face if you're just gay. They say, "Well, what are you doing? You're a liar. Just go all the way with it." So you also they're like, "Don't don't just pretend." So they rather you just make go all the way. Instead of pretending to be like being, uh, I guess, gay, I guess that's how they look at it. They're like, uh, I'm trying not to get you guys canceled here. Oh, um, it, it was a long time <laughs> too, ago. That too happened. late, man. Good we, luck. Okay, cool. Yeah, their, their thing is like, you know, fuck it. What are you doing? Just go all the way with it. If you want to be that way, then go all the way. Don't hide it. <laughs> all right. I kind of like it. All in. All in. Um, interesting. <laughs> but uh, to be, I didn't, I didn't really spend... The, yes, the nightlife is around. A lot of the camps I were at were in the uh, different places, uh, somewhere in the mountainsides, in the jungle, somewhere in the countryside, somewhere nice in the in, in beach areas. Uh, so and it wasn't until what they consider Bangkok or is this considered like the hunting ground? Like that's where everyone wants to go to um, for at least for fighting. I personally didn't like the train there necessarily because running through the traffic i like running in the mountains in the country or in the jungle um but you, you see the nightlife um but surprisingly you don't see them around all the time it's kind of like you if you're into that nightlife thing you'll you'll run into them more but they have their like certain districts and for me i didn't really want to partake in that because that's what was what not what was not what i was there for i was there right. for the sole purpose of inflicting violence and as a foreigner and i knew i carried uh for some of the situations being that i was one of the uh americans over there the the the, the first americans to really you know myself and, and another friend of mine cyrus washington we were really so in my mentality i was like look i don't need to fuck this up because I'm not going to give America a bad rep because if mm. I fuck this up, I might close the door on some other people. So I knew I had a sort of responsibility to uh, say like, look, I mean, this, you know, I'm going to open the door for other Americans to come over. So for me, I had a little bit more of the the discipline part. Like, so I, yeah, that's sometimes go out, but you know, I didn't really partake, partake in a night like too, too much. That, yeah. I love that out of you though. That's, that's fairly incredible forward thinking by you and, and sounds very mature, especially for someone who you said you went over there at 18 or you, when did you go over there at first? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I think I was 18, 19. I just turned 19, maybe. 
What was the connection to to Thailand? Was there somebody you knew who had been over there or someone who helped you get over there into those camps? Uh, well, you have to remember, when I was born, so 1976, I think we brought the last troops back from Vietnam in 73. Mm-hmm. I think the war technically ended. So I had a lot of family that was in Vietnam, and they would do a lot of their R&R in okay. uh, Thailand. So it wasn't a foreign concept. Like, it was funny. I would have uncles that would tell me, like, yeah, I went to this place. And they do this sort of fancy karate. And I was like, what the fuck? And like, yeah, some fancy karate. And they would tell me about it. And so it wasn't, Southeast Asia was not a foreign concept uh, sure. to me coming up. I just never really, you know, I was into other sports. So when I got over there, uh, that's a funny story. Because I remember I had a fight against a guy in New York. Um, and I remember I was a VHS, so I had brought it back. And uh it was uh on my granny's house uh, uh for Thanksgiving. And I remember I was showing it to all my uncles and my father at the time, and 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 it, all they were doing was they were just making fun of me. They were like, "Why are you turn your back? Why you look tired?" And they were like, "That's because he smoked weed. He ain't serious." And then they just kept making fun of me. <laughs> I remember I took the beach just till I smashed it on the floor and broke. And I was like, "Man, fuck all y'all!" And and I, they were just laughing. And then they were like, "Why don't you go over there and uh beat up on them uh them little Asian people?" Go over there. You over here beating up on somebody from where you from? Brooklyn. You beating up on there. If you want to really be the man, go be the man on their block. You know, and that really stuck with me. So what ended up happening? There was uh, a gift from uh, my father. He took me over there and left me because I remember we got to the hotel and I was like, "Man, this is nice." And I was like, "Oh, but they messed up. There's one bed." And he was like, "Oh, no, no, buddy. This is your dream." I see you later, boy. He's like the flight, your, your your return flight leaves at such and such time. Good luck. I didn't know where <laughs> I was going. I had money saved, low money saved up, working job and stuff. And <laughs> hold on a second. I never, I never saw him uh, uh, again. He did what he had to do, and I remember I went through the kitchen staff and I started asking, like, "Hey, uh, uh, I know how to say knock moy, which is like tie fighter," and I would make the gestures of like punching and uh, and they were and I was like, "Hey, uh, I want to go." find a gym and so I started walking around Bangkok and then some of the gyms they were like uh my my me for long which was like we don't want nothing to do with foreigners and I was like oh fuck what am I gonna do and so I just kept went back to the kid now mind just the morning time so I you know it wasn't like pitch black night when he threw me out uh uh but so I found one guy I was in the kitchen staff I guess he was a former fighter he he wrote something on a uh like uh uh, index card kind of thing. He wrote something on there and he was like, give it to this, uh, go outside and give it to the cab. He spoke broken English. So I remember I get, went outside, gave it to this, uh, it was in Thai, so I gave it to the guy. He drove me uh, three hours out to a place, Patun Tani, and uh, to, a, to a gym there. And uh, uh, I gave him the money I had. They took me in and, and, that, and that was it. You just trusted this guy to drive you three hours? The You have no idea where he's taking you? No idea. I mean, he could have he could have slaughtered me for all I know. I was just like, man, I got to do this. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. This is I, I told y'all y'all were in for a ride, man. <laughs> the Dorian I know what happened. It could've it could have ended horribly. I mean, he could have put my, you know, he'd been a cannibal for all I know, put my head on a stake or something to fillet my body. I don't know. I was like, this <laughs> oh. is what I'm here for. This now, is I just my father told me before he died, like this, hey, he's like, I was leave. I was like, all right, I found somewhere. He's like, all right, we'll get your shit and go. And I was like, uh, Cause he had let me leave my bags in the room. To, All right, man, go ahead. Man. I got business to take care. Get your shit and go on out there. And uh, he was like, oh, by the way, it's like, uh, I don't know if you know this. Don't get locked up in third world countries because shit might not be bad. This shit could be bad for you. And I, <laughs> fuck. And that was that's it. That's I didn't see him. Uh, uh, he, he did what he did. And I stayed over there. Wow. This is. Um, that was the I, first thing as a teenager. So, yeah. Th- that's a wild story. But also, this is just one of many. Uh, common instances in the in the people that Drake introduces me to. Drake is just like built ex- like you and you're Drake's kind of people. So this makes sense that you guys. Uh, that's, that's my boy. I love him, man. That's my bro. That's my bro. I'm glad somebody yeah, yeah. does because I don't. Um, <laughs> the uh, fuck that. I don't even know where to go from there. So talk to. But I want to hear about uh, your your impression of Drake when uh, when Drake started training with y'all. Like, what was your first impression, and how has he come along in the in the fighting world through your eyes? He's a monster. He's an absolute savage. I mean, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. I mean, athletically wise. I mean, his desire to to learn and discipline. I mean, all, all the things that made him, you know, uh, 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 a great football player and, and help him achieve what he got. I mean, you can see it in the martial arts. So the sky's oh, I, I, 
Are we, we going to see our boy succeed in the ring sometime, you think? Absolutely. Whatever he wants to do, he's going to succeed at. Whatever he wants to do. I hate Shout hearing out. that. Appreciate you, Coach. I'm glad I can't see your face, Drake. Um, <laughs> that's – um. he is uh, – Drake's Drake's gifted. He he has some he has some talents. Very much um, he uh he he told us about so you're in Nashville right now. Hell no. Not no. anymore. No, no, no. I'm in I'm in uh DC uh, uh okay. right now. I'm originally okay. from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. Um yeah, when once he started uh once he started up with jujitsu and and doing all this stuff, he's it's it seems that he comes back every month or so with some cool new guy he's met or some new coach or some somebody got to roll with. And this yeah. is just another one of those experiences. So this is, this is really awesome. Um, so you start training in Thailand, you're a young mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. What is at, at that point, what's the biggest, uh, where's your biggest gap? Like, is there a day early on where you're like, Holy smokes, I am light years behind these people. Uh, well, I was humble enough and real, re, real enough with myself to understand that, uh, you know, there was going to be a huge uh, uh, gap because of the fact that, um, you know, the ties that they 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 start at the ages of eight. A lot of times they'll leave yeah. their village, and uh, if they excuse me, if they show promise and they'll go and start fighting to make money uh, for their family. So a lot of times, by the time they're sixteen, if they don't have about a hundred, hundred fifty fights, they're not really considered a prospect. And their prime is only technically from 16 to maybe 22. It's getting a little older now because humans are living longer, but mostly that's when they consider like the uh, prime, what they call the stadium uh, years, which is uh, about 16 to 22. Wow. Um, so I, I knew it was the gap. And then the, the clinching was the biggest thing because their level of clinching is just in, in, incredible. Uh I got a story of uh, there was one camp I knew that they would uh, they would clinch. So it's almost like a form. It's like wrestling, so but like what you can knee, you can elbow. Of course, you're not elbowing in the training, but you can. Uh, we play with the elbows, but not like uh, the severity of in a fight. Uh, but we knee and 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 clinch, and uh, just getting thrown on my head left and right. And and one of the stories. So this would be on my second stint uh, there. Uh, the, there was a camp and what they would do is they have a lot of times you have water buffaloes and water buffaloes are, are, are part farm animal, part, uh, part pet for some of the villages. And the boys would clinch in the camp. And then what they would do is they would get out of the ring after clinching and they would start grabbing the, the buffalo by the horn and start trying to move it. And it's playing with them and they don't realize they're actually getting stronger. So they would clinch with you and they would hop out the ring and they would go over to the water buffalo and they would start like playing around with it. And the buffalo would just move his head. They're very docile animals, move, they'd move his head. So literally, they're literally getting like strong. And then the way they would, the uh, coconut trees, they'd actually climb the trees. I mean, you can't see me, but they like put their feet and hands on the tree and they push themselves up. And uh, just uh, living like that, I think makes them like a lot stronger. And then training in the heat and things like that, like I, I got a lot stronger over there. How Just, hot is it on an average day over there? Um, depending on what part of the country you're in, I'd say obviously the jungle, the countryside gets hot. I'd say uh, average, mm, maybe eighty, but some days it can feel like it's a hundred something with you know all hundred percent humidity. humidity. Yeah, hundred percent humidity. Well. There was one camp uh, where the guy was trying to make put space heaters in there to make it hotter. He would Jesus close it off. Christ. Most of them are over, and he would close it off to make it hotter. So that was always funny. Oh man, all you fighter wrestling uh, martial arts types guys, y'all are freaking nuts. Y'all know really, that they're built different. <laughs> and just you gotta love what you do. That's all. I, um, I hear that. Did you uh, did you learn how to climb a coconut tree yourself? Could you go do it? Uh. I, I, I did learn, but then I got smarter and realized, wait a minute, I just take one of these bamboo sticks and knock the shit down myself. It'd be a lot easier than breaking my neck trying to get up there. So I use my brain power. Uh, there you go. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, fuck, I, that's just un... Drake, when you oh, start tell them about, hold on, Clue, tell them about the, uh, <clears throat> tell them about the fight schedule that you have over there, the frequency of fights. Um... You'll fight, okay, so as, as kids, I mean, I think the most I did in one week was three. Uh... In 
the, the you'll you'll fight on a regular uh base, especially as kids. So you might fight in this in this in the, in the, let's say somewhere in in the morning time on a Saturday. Then they'll check you the big boss or look to see if anything's busted up or anything, and then you'll go fight in the uh in the nighttime. So kids might fight four times in a weekend. They actually have a festival in the Tide, which is their version of New Year, um, because Thailand is actually on a different calendar than we are. So I forget. I think the year is 26 something now. Um, but their New Year, they are uh, in a place called uh, Isan, which is where a lot of the fighters come from. Um, so think of Isan like New England. It's a lot of different provinces and places inside of there mm -hmm. um, in a place called uh, Buridong. They'll have a festival where they'll set up a ring, you'll have referees and things like that, and there'll be actual fights. And sometimes you can fight, you can fight drunk, maybe the refs are drunk, and they're actually real fights. And you just fight, maybe you can fight four or five times on the day. <laughs> Jesus so Christ. Did you ever partake? No, I never went up there. I wish I did, because a lot of boys would come back, and I would always joke with them and say, hey, how many fights did you have? And they'll say, oh, you know, I had five fights, or I had seven fights, and – uh and so they'll like have, and, shit. and are they are they getting paid for all of these? Uh, those no, that's just like a labor of love. But for the other fights, uh, yeah, we we get paid. But you have to think, you have to look at it like, in a lot of ways, for the ties, it's like being a racehorse. So you can get traded. For instance, if I'm the big boss of a camp, and this isn't always the case, but if I'm the big boss and you're a big boss, well, I could bet you and say, okay, I bet you. 28,000, which is used US, US dollars, 28,000 and my fighter wins. You could say, okay, but if your fighter wins, you could then say, and not only do I get the money, but I get your fighter as well. And then, so my fighter has to then come to your camp and he'll take the last name of your camp. And that's very common. That that's, is common. It's not always the case uh, because you can- So if you're the fighter and you lose, you just don't get much of a say, like otherwise you're getting kicked out of your home camp or what? Not kicked out. You just might go to the other camp. I mean, traded, I Kevin, like traded. Sport. Yeah, traded almost. I mean, but you have to. It's not always the case, you know. I could always say because fighters are always bought, and then you could say, "Look, I, I want to buy your fighter." So you'll see fighters fight under a lot of different last names. Like sometimes you might see my name being uh, Dorian Sipmochai or uh, Dorian Calcutech or Dorian uh, Look Provide. It could be different uh, names for the camp you're fighting on. Now it's not very common for. As, as foreigners, we're not upheld by the same rules as Thai people, obviously. Um, but, yeah, you could just say, hey, I want to buy that fighter. How much? And now you might say, oh, it's uh, $100,000. Let's just say $100,000 or whatever for the time, I, effort I spent building them up, whatever the case. So I give you that, and then he comes on over to my camp, takes my last the, the, the last name of uh, my camp, and uh, he goes and, uh, and, and, he, and he fights. So like all the like there's obviously fights all the time. Yeah. Going seven, everywhere. Seven. Is this is this like Thailand's most popular sport, would you say? Yeah, it's a national sport. There are fights seven days, seven days a week. Uh at any given time. There could be uh do all do all the young kids grow up like learning how to fight and stuff? Uh a lot of it, it's it's a weird dynamic because it'll work like this. If it is the national sport, but if a kid comes from money. You'll see though their family will put them in taekwondo or they'll go into boxing because okay. those are Olympic sports. And you know, it's more prestige winning a gold medal than just yeah. doing Muay Thai. They still kind of view Muay Thai as a it's it's changing now with you know um the global recognition that it's that the sport is now getting but shut out one championship. Yeah, the one's doing great things. It's seen as a uh it was always seen as like a poor man's sport, even though it was the national sport. But if you are uh, came from money, you would want to put your child into Taekwondo or uh, boxing in hopes of going to the Olympics. But it's not rare for most of these guys, the, the fighters, you, it's not rare to find fight, uh, fighters with 500, 600. I think the record is 900, but he said he lost count. I mean, I would too. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Of times, yeah, you probably lose count pretty easily. Because oh you fight your perpetual state and you want to fight. You just you're doing all the training and you don't want to like sit around there. Just you there's a point where you want to fight. Like I think I would get maybe three weeks to or maybe a month if I had a really big fight, uh, which was you know good. I wouldn't want any more time than that to get ready for a fight. Uh, because you're in a perpetual state of 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 uh readiness. I mean, you're 
training all the time. You don't want to just keep doing that. At some point, you get to the point where, look, man, I want to fuck somebody up for all this. So you <laughs> want to fight at some I, point. I hear that. I mean, that's playing football. That's like one of the things that I dislike most about the sport is, you know, the practice to play ratio is just mm-hmm. is horrible, right? You get to play yeah. college football 12 games a year max, right? Um, so I'm curious, like, it, all these fights going on, like, on a local – yeah, your local gym on a Tuesday night. How many people are from the from the town are showing up to these fights? Is it like a big affair every night? Like that's what no, you go to dinner, you go watch the fights, or what? Uh, depending on where you are. Uh, and for instance, on Sundays, uh, there are times where uh, a lot of fighters will uh, in the village, like they'll stop and there are always fights on TV, so they'll watch like the big fights and stuff on on Sundays, being at like the original Lumpini. Uh, They'll watch the now that there's the one FC. Uh, they'll watch those those type of fights because there's gambling going on all the time. But you might have smaller, excuse me, smaller venues like in the village or little stadiums like that. No, you know, maybe go to that. But uh, it just depends on where you are. But yes, and the, for instance, when I retired, I started working as a commentator for a show called Max Retire. And at one point, we were the most popular uh show around and uh we had fights seven days a week and uh i purposely lived down uh uh, and walking distance from the from the stadium and uh yeah you just getting uh because i ended up going that was my actually retirement fight and i was invited to a camp there and it was by invitation only so you there was the gym didn't even have a fucking address i mean it was just you had to fight on match with invitation. There was no website. There was no way to come there unless you were invited. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting. So we'd always have a uh, – we were actually a sponsored gym for a match, so we all were contracted to fight on uh, the Max show. So it was uh, – yeah, it was, it was it was pretty fun. Like uh, the guys, well, you know, when we have fights, we'd all just go down to the stadium, and uh, that's kind of how it works out. Like if you're um, – near one of the big stadiums like Bangkok, you know, everybody's coming out to watch. So I guess Damn. kind of where you're at. So, so you were there, you said from 2009 to 2020. Uh, yes. Right. And, at the start of COVID. And the first time you were there back when you were 18 lasted how long? That was a seven month stint. So that was a I'll, small, small time. Very small, very small. Yeah. Cause I had so, to come back to obligations to, in the U S what, so how many total fights did you have when you were over there? Jeez, I don't remember. It's quite a bit. Hundreds. No, I didn't get the hundred mark. Total only have uh Dozens. eight. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was a good amount. I think the most I had in one year was I want to say twenty, maybe. This so it really doesn't take, or at least for you, or for I guess for all of if that's just kind of the culture of of the sport over there is like the recovery for this. It, like it doesn't take much. It either doesn't take much to recover or you're really good at recovering or you just don't give a shit and you just fight. You know, your body, your body hardens. Um, and that's one of the things the big boss was, you know, they were, they were really good about your, your, your body hardens. The more you fight and obviously you're going to fight with a sense of IQ. So it's not so much like what you're used to seeing in the UFC or things where guys are, I consider the striking level relatively low. It's starting to rise a little bit now, but, uh, you're fighting with IQ, so you're not really just throwing wild stuff or just smashing your bones into other guys. Like you, you have technique with it, but through all the rigorous training, um, the bag work, the pad work, your body does actually harden, and uh, your bones uh, calcify. Uh, everything gets gets harder. I, and I believe, don't quote me, but I think it was called it's called Wolf's Law. Like your body will adapt to the stressors that's pla- placed upon it. So, for instance, like you guys playing football, your body does harden to the sport of football. Whereas if I was to go out and play football, my body would probably break in half because it's not conditioned mm-hmm. to the trauma that's required to participate in that sport. For my sport, my body was hardened for the trauma. For instance, I do jujitsu. Uh, I, I, I feel like I took 10 fights, uh, 10 tie fights from doing jujitsu because my and body. I go to one tie practice and i feel like i just went through 10 fights yeah see your body's conditioned for jujitsu where mine is not but then if you were to come when you come to tie boxing my body is conditioned for that so your body conditions for the uh event you put it under and also you things are within reason yes there are times where and that's how you develop your iq what i you know um 
I had a really smart uh, big boss named PA uh, from Simple Chai. And like, there would be times I'd break my hand. Well, I would still go fight and you just don't use that hand. So you learn how to develop your other weapons or maybe my shin uh, would be hurt. Cause when I first went over the second stint, I actually lost my vision and I never regained all of my vision back in my eye. So I learned how to develop sort of an elbow thing because I couldn't really see good out of one eye. And, and that's th that's still something you deal with right now is a lo vision loss? Oh, it's not coming back, yeah. Because whatever happened, it's got, it got some sort of infection in it. And uh, by the time I got it uh, fixed, uh, it had already done its damage. So it's uh, not I'm not blind in it, but it, 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 it's very, like, if I close one eye, it's very difficult. Um, it's Shit. just fuzzy. How but many, it was no problem. Yeah, I mean, part. during it, during it, that sounds like a problem a little bit. Nah, uh, if I'm being honest, no, nah, that's part of the game. Because after I got, I couldn't see. I remember I lied to get onto the. There was a big fight in the Philippines, and uh, I needed money. I was run. I had no more money from the money I saved for coming over there, and uh, I was like, "Well, fuck, I got a fight." And uh, there just so happened to be a spot they were looking for in America. It was a four man tournament, uh, and I remember. Uh, they were asking me, uh, the, the people at the camp, like, can you see? I was like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. And then I remember I turned to my buddy, like, uh, my trainer, he's like, can you see? I was like, no, nah, I'm blind as shit, man. And inside, like, man, it's fucked. <laughs> and he was like, oh, okay. And so I was like, yeah, I'm taking this fight. So I went over and I just remember lying to the guy. I was like, man, I see perfectly. Everything's fine. Let's go. You are a crazy son of a bitch. <laughs> Unbelievable. In the fight, the guy fucked up my good eye. So I was like, oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> you motherfucker. It was a four man tournament. And uh, he stopped me in the second round. I was like, you motherfucker, how are you going to swell my good eye? The <laughs> funny part of that story is my face is swollen and everything. I went, it was a, like a Chinese thing doing a show. And also, if uh, we ever invade China, I got a beef with them. I'm going over. Them motherfuckers going to see me again. <laughs> 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 them and motherfuckers going to see me <laughs> again. They, but that's another story. I won't go down that rabbit hole. But down the Philippines, I go there. And when I'm going to the airport, I remember uh, uh, before you go into the Philippines, you into their airport, you have to go through security. You know, I don't know if they changed it, but you had to go through. You have to go through security before they get into the airport. So you put your stuff on the conveyor and all that. So I just had all my pesos, the Filipino currency, and put it on there. And I remember these military people are like, "Oh, they saw that my face swollen, looked like I just got mugged." And then I remember going through. The metal detector, they see me, they called me over and they were like, oh, you have drugs in your bag. I was like, yeah, all right. I know, man. How much is this going to cost, man? Like, I'm hip to the game. I was like, how much? So I they started it. I gave them the money. Then they gave me my money back because you have to pay a tax to leave the Philippines. So uh, yeah, they took my money from the fight. And then oh, I remember shit. as I got back, I was like, hey, man, you motherfuckers got to give me a fight in like two days. And so I got another fight and uh, for the guy. Because in the provinces, there's no weight classes. So I fought the guy that was... Uh, 205, 205 pounds. I weighed about maybe one. My fight weight was 158. So I probably maybe weigh 165. There's no um, weight classes? In the provinces. You just, you show up. So maybe the guy is, uh, uh, maybe he's good. Maybe he's not good. Maybe he's a former champion. Maybe he's not. You know, you don't know. You show up and uh, that's how you make your name. So you fight in the provinces. That's what I was doing in the gyms in Bangkok. They start to hear about you. If you're doing right and then you make a name and you go to Bangkok and these bigger shows where there'll actually be weigh-ins and weight classes. But in the provinces, you just kind of, you, you, you show up. Because Thai boxing, there, there's one thing about it, which I love, and the Thais will say this. They don't, sometimes they don't care about winning or losing. They'll actually put you in a fight sometimes where they, you don't really have a chance to win. And all they care about, they just want to see your courage. And I asked them about it and they said, uh, the trainer's like, yeah, you can always give a man skill. You can never give a man heart. So if you show you have heart, they can do something with you. But if you can give a man all the skill in the world, but if he has no heart, it doesn't matter. And they won't waste their time. They'll be very nice because they're friendly and, and they're, they're great people and they'll be nice. But why would they waste their time and invest in you? So a lot of times that's what they say all the time. Uh, no problem as long as you fight with heart. There are fights that I've lost and I was sad, but they were so proud that I fought with heart and courage. And there are fights where I won and they were like, uh, you know, kind of like, yeah, hey, what the fuck? Um, I'm gonna they write only, that. They yeah. only care about courage. It's an interesting thing. I'm gonna and write that down. A I skilled, a skilled pussy isn't worth anything. Man, uh, okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah, because if you pay a hooker to leave, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. 
Um, did you, so you were fighting at the top level eventually? Eventually I did. I mean, my, my, I'd say my career is, you know, being honest was like, uh, uh, somewhat spotty a lot of times because I would fight a whole lot and then I would like take a break and then, you know, do whatever. Maybe I'd go to Australia or, or, or somewhere else. I ended up getting caught up in uh I got a really good friend. It's like my brother, you know, a uh, guy named by the name of Matt Brown. And um shout out the immortal, know. dude. Yeah, love Matt, man. And uh he's done a lot for me as a coach career. So when he would have fights, he would actually, you know, hey, you know, it started off, we were just friends and he saw I and I had some skill and then you know, more than anybody else around on his college, he was like, Hey, why don't you start? You know, we were just friends. So he would like, hey, come back. And I never thought of myself as his coach. I was like, hey, this is my friend. Loyalty is important to me. You know, he was doing, I was like, man, you know, you're going to do great things in this. So he would bring me back from Thailand a lot of times. So I ended up getting kind of, I don't want to say forced, but like he, I guess, saw something in me that I didn't see in myself with the coaching thing. So I did fight at the high level eventually, but I would have probably, I could have done better had I not gone back to, to coach. Okay. And, and and things like that, because people started recognizing I had a talent for or an ability to relay the information uh, yeah. in such a way to help people improve. And with Matt and coming back with Matt, he was showing some of my style. We helped uh, invent a clinch. So I don't, you know, so I, I a lot of my fights, what they would call Mui Wak, where you like kind of like temple fights, smaller fights, but they're raw because, you know, sometimes you only have to wear a mouthpiece. Then I would start fighting in the uh, Lumpini, which was considered the Mecca. And when that kind of closed down, I kind of, it, it broke my heart because I really was making a big name in that stadium in Bangkok. So, yeah, I fought at the high, I got to the high level, but um, um, a lot of my career fought in Europe and things, but a lot of my career was, you know, kind of spotty because I would also come back to help guys and people started seeing me more as a coach a lot of times. They really liked, I guess, the way I relate information so yeah talking to you right now i i kind of so i'm a fitness coach and you know it's not the same thing but coaching there is one uh and we had a lot of great coaches when we played football and the the biggest thing about coaching is Mm -hmm. um, someone who's great at doing it isn't always great at coaching it because there's that there's you you have to relay that information in a way that the person learning can understand it um and, and connecting with certain individuals certain athletes certain players Mm -hmm. um they all learn differently so you have to be able to to figure that out and just communicating with you right now it feels like you are really good at 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 speaking and kind of relaying information so it 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 feels like you would be a great coach in my opinion Uh, that's the product of the people i was around so i can't take credit around of all that because i was you know uh blessed to be around uh, great coaches going back to my first instructor, Mr. C, the Navy. So I was talking about just uh, they really shaped me because they say, like, uh, I believe you have in this world is you have uh, when you become a fighter, you you experience two births and two deaths. So you have your birth with the, you come into this world. And then when you embark on this journey to be a fighter, you have another birth. And then eventually, you know, that will come to an end. Hopefully, you know, that dies before your life dies. You no know, thing. Uh, yeah. So I, my birth into this was, you know, being around the SEALs and, and, and military people. So they really shaped, my, shaped me a lot in terms of if anybody's had the, the pleasure to be around special forces people, you can just see they have such an attention for detail. And mm-hmm. that attention to detail instilled in me as a young kid, because I was just a young punk, but that is still that uh, attention for detail, uh, uh, attention that being honorable and, and things like that, though, those are the life lessons that what I think a martial artist should embody. And uh, the things that they would see, the drills that they would give me, I use later on in, in my life um, and in my, later on in my career. But from there to being having the, 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 the instructors I had in Thailand to my sensei in, in Holland, uh, uh, I've been very, very, uh, uh, for even to the guy I'm working with now, the guy by the name of Master Lloyd Irvin, you know, just being around these people was what has shaped me. And in a lot of ways, being around a guy like Matt Brown, you know, having a, such a good friend like him, uh, he shaped me a lot of times too, because part of it is I had to become humble and being humble. I, I thought I always consider myself humble, but humility has helped me learn more than anything, knowing that, okay, I don't know everything. So, uh, being willing to uh, uh, 
that's what I say. If I was Matt's coach, I don't think I would have been as good. But being willing to say if Matt says, hey, look, if you show me this tie clinch this way, but look, I've been going to the Ohio State wrestling room and, you know, we're doing this. So if I try to tie away uh, against a good wrestler, they're just going to do this and this. So I was like, OK, let's play with it then. So we would experiment to the point where we started inventing our own clinch and uh, things like that. Or, hey, I, I, I saw this way of doing something. And Matt's a very, very intelligent individual. Um, I saw this way of doing it, uh, uh, or a guy showed me this type of kick and he would, he would actually take me around to a lot of places. Uh, um, so I got the opportunity to get into a lot of rooms. Like I remember once he went, he was living in Colorado and he went to the Olympic training center and, uh, cause we knew a guy from Ohio state university, uh, and he was over there at the wrestling room. So, uh, I was like, Hey, I'm going to come with you too. So I would go and, you know, learn and pick other people's brains. So I guess I, you know, uh, that sort of empty the cup sort of mentality is what would help me um, becoming a coach. But I'm still learning to be a coach, if that makes sense. Sure. So no, I, I get it. It, so- it sounds like where you're supposed to be to me. Um, okay. And uh, it's it's cool to listen to you talk about it. Um, I have only one more question, then I'll let these other guys. Uh, I, I want to go back to the training just for mm-hmm. this in general, specifically over in Thailand. Did mm-hmm. they Did they focus on any sort of recovery? in those, like when, when they would have you get off of your feet, was there anything specific other than just kind of being off of your feet that would help you recover from sessions, recover from those long six mile, three, four mile runs, um, day in, day out, or was it just really kind of like, again, the body hardening, you just kind of got used to it. Um, well, remember they have a, if you ever experienced like Thai massages, Thai massages are not like those sensual massages, they're painful and they're actually stretch you at the same time that you're getting a massage. And so a lot of times one, your body's warm because you're basically, you're essentially training in a sauna. The other yeah. thing is all the showers, like for instance, except there was one camp where there was no shower. We just had to use a bucket, like a trash bin to, to bathe out of. Cool. Uh, but most of the time, the garden hose, whatever we were using the shower, the water's cold. Mm. So you're always taking like a cold sort of uh, sure shower regardless. Um, there's, there was no hot water really. And so um, we would get massages. Um how often? Uh, whenever you need it, like it's sometimes like the the best massage where I got with from the it was like uh the blind they were like these blind people and then they knew how to find every they were like masks it was so painful I once had to wear my mouthpiece. Wow, because the time massage it doesn't it stretches you at the same time it massages you sure. so they'll do a lot of that but uh how do you feel afterwards though? There's rest and recovery because our strength and conditioning really was just. When you're trying to move another human being in the clinch, you're getting stronger. But what we do is we do a lot of pull-ups, push-ups, dips, sit-ups, you're responsible. And then uh, actually just hitting the bag, which were not um, – we couldn't fill the bag like this in the Western world because somebody will go to jail. So they're filled very hard, very dense. Um, you're doing a lot of push pull-ups, a lot of dips, a lot of uh, uh, sit-ups. and never, uh, never really touch weights, did you? You would have, for instance, there might be a, a barbell. We took like one camp. We had like these little paint things and we filled it with concrete and put like a pole on the damn sure. thing. Rusty as shit. And you would just do a lot of reps for that. Maybe you just do a hundred of them. You do cool. upright reps, do whatever. Hell but, yeah. uh, the, what we think of as strength and conditioning is not so much because they were more focused on the technical aspect of it, of being technical and developing your power and things sure. like that. We would do... uh because we run long distances very slow. What the misconception is we never ran those long distances for cardio. Sure. We just strengthen our legs. Our cardio will come when we would smash the pads or our cardio will come at the end. We would do uh, wind sprints. After the end of practice, we would, you know, uh, do do wind sprints. But strength and conditioning is starting to develop now as the ties and uh, more, more foreigners are starting to come over, more Westerners are coming over, introducing uh, – uh, strength and conditioning things. Um, um, as more ties are starting to fight and, and and travel abroad, they're starting to bring this stuff back. But I'd I'd say that the rest and recovery concept, uh, the strength and conditioning concept, is is still at a lower level compared to where it is in uh, sure uh, the 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 Western world. So it's starting to come up. Cool, cool answer. Over there, it's kind of like just don't be a pussy. Like motherfucker fight. Like I, I, I've, I got that over the course of you d- describing all this. I, I don't think I'd be cut out for all the stuff you're explaining. Um, 
So I'm glad it was you, not me. Uh, Kevin, Grant, Drake, you haven't said a fucking word. I've been soaking all this up myself. So you guys jump in with whatever you got. Go ahead, Kevin. What um, you've obviously been exposed to a few different martial arts. What, is is Thai, Muay Thai your favorite, or do you got a um a, a one that oh. speaks to you more than any other? And don't lie and tell them that jujitsu ain't really creeping up on your heart. No, no, no. I love no, look. I love jujitsu. Uh, I I love it because it's 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 something you can do for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, Whereas Muay Thai, at, at some point, you know, it it, it it has to end, even in terms of, like, going out there playing around. Now, for sure, I could clinch whoever, but Jiu-Jitsu is such a uh, – for me, I like Jiu-Jitsu because Jiu-Jitsu is confusing to me. Muay Thai was always easy for me. Uh, the clinching, the things, the way my – maybe the way my brain worked and trying to solve the puzzle, but Jiu-Jitsu has always been a puzzle that's hard for me. You know, I'm still only a, a purple belt, but I like it because there's so – it's 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 never ending. It's challenging, uh, uh, and and for whatever reason, like um, at times it becomes very frustrating. So I I very much like it. Like I've always been a fan uh, of of of, of jujitsu, of wrestling. Even though I wasn't a wrestler, I've I've, I've been a fan of those. Um, but yeah, Muay Thai was always uh, uh, in my in my in my heart. Um, and one of the reasons it was where it wasn't MMA is because I had two brothers. One brother passed, and uh, um. Um, I made a promise to him like I was going to go uh, uh, to I had been to Thailand. So I come back. I was like, look, man, I'm going to, you know, go fight Lumpini and all I do that. So that's why I wanted to like never really cared about MMA. Um, sure. Because I want to make sure that as, as a man, I always fulfill my promises. Um, so Respect I don't know that longer uh, uh, answer than you were looking for. No, no, the, no, the, no. That's awesome, man. Answers are great. Yeah. G-Bone, you got anything? Great. You got to ask him a question, Doc. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, you got into, you've been involved in martial arts for a really long time. Uh, so compared to when you started to now, uh, what's the biggest kind of outside of just popularity? What What do you feel like is the biggest change in the sport? And then as like a follow up, uh, like a part two to the question, where do you think the sport is in 20 more years from now? Okay. Um, I say at the athletes, the with the strength and conditioning, and 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 the, and the kids are starting. Even in the Western world, the kids are starting younger. Um, they're like, uh, I think we have yet to see a. Right now, your best athletes are going to go to football, or they're going to still gravitate towards basketball. Mm -hmm. I think twenty more years, we're going to see a freak athlete who should be like a, I don't know, how, a Javon Curse. Do we remember who he is? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. A, a freak, a freak athlete like that, or LeBron James. I think we might see one of those guys start martial arts and end up in MMA. You know, as opposed to on that path of of ending up in the NFL, ending up in uh, um, uh, in, in the NBA. So That'd I think cool. that 20, 20 years. I, I hope, I hope the money will 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 allow that to happen. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, the other part of the questions. That, you know, you yeah. answered it. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, you, kind uh, of a... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, do you see uh, like some of those tall, lanky basketball players being able to have success at like 6'8 plus like uh, in the martial arts game? Uh, for sure, yeah. In NBA, there's a guy in, uh, 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 I think it's PFL. He's pretty tall. Uh, Stefan he... Struve was 6'11". Stefan Struve, uh, semi Shilt from Holland was actually seven feet. Uh, wow, you have uh, the uh, uh, Tim Sylvia was tall. You have so you have guys now, athletic wise. Uh, you have a new guy now named uh, uh, Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill, he was a, I think, basketball player. And uh, uh, our, our, our buddy Derek Overstreet was a defensive uh, end at uh, Western Kentucky. Yeah, I mean, so you know, he he was coming. I mean, uh, 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 he he was uh, so he was a new type of 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 of, of breed like that. I and mean, then you have Drake. So you have these guys that are starting to come now. I mean, you know, I just think in uh, twenty more years, you know, instead of them coming after their careers are over, they're mm -hmm. gonna that career. They're gonna start and then progress and just go all the way. Yeah, uh, the money will go. Uh, the downside of that is uh. I think what's happening is uh, with social media, uh, 
we're losing a lot of the warriors, like the 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 the, hard, the battle hardened guys, like the Matt Browns, the, the, the these grizzly veterans. Um, uh, because I I personally think society's getting softer, um, really soft. Uh, we can agree I mean, on that. We have a hard fucking time. You know, I mean, we still trying to figure out what the fuck a man and a woman is. I mean, that's pretty fucking simple. I mean, <laughs> it's simple as shit, ain't it, Coach? Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable to me. But we now we now we done figured out. We done added fifteen other fucking uh. Genders. I'm 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 confused and shit. You know, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box, but get, fuck, man. Like, can we keep it <laughs> so I I just I recently learned like pretty much my entire childhood has been canceled. Uh uh Al Bundy and Mary with Children was gone. Pretty much all the shows I grew up watching pretty much were all canceled now. Um, so I think in society we've gotten soft, and I think that will that, that trickles into combat sports. Um it's it's for the nature of it, you're just it's very primal. I mean, uh, but but do you see like the people who like are just like a softer generation? I, mean, I just don't see those people like finding their way to martial arts, MMA, any of that kind well, of stuff. Well, once if you, if you're ever gonna, if you think about it like this and look at all sports, if you remember back to the NBA, these guys were getting in fist fights, punching each other in the face. You think about how hard NFL used to be. You think about the Johnny Unitas era and those eras. Um, I don't know if I'm dating myself. Remember Johnny Unitas? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. yeah. So if you think about that era and then move on to the Lawrence Taylor era and then look at where things are now, rules have changed. I mean, I think overall, I, we're I hear that faster. The the athletes might be more might be more athletic. You know, the plays might be more spectacular, but that sort of hardened like n n like manly man thing is starting to go. Just away. mean motherfuckers. Mean mean motherfuckers that are really out there trying to rip your fucking head off. Uh, I don't even know if you could have the steel curtain anymore. You know, they they probably would be They'd fine. be arrested, coach. They would be arrested, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, what was my – the running back, the moose. The you moose. love the moose, man. The that moose. was my nickname from him. Coach called me the moose. The moose. <laughs> he couldn't play. I mean, they were they – were, they were, if you look back at that era, they were – they were men playing manly sports. And I think what's happening, even, even in combat sports, everything is just a, a generation. We are getting softer, which is another reason why I enjoy living in Thailand, in the jungle, uh, <clears throat> because I still think you, because it has that gladiatorial feel. You're sure. around, being around hard things. And uh, because personally, I, I, I hope I'm dead and gone before this thing goes, before this world goes completely completely soft and into the shitter. Um, that's why I searched out places like that. Cause I, I, I thrive in those type of, uh, uh, Spartan, those harder, uh, conditions. I mean, even, uh, I'll tell you a cool story of Thailand, uh, uh, to kind of prove my point. Um, I was working I, when I retired, uh, my last fight was, uh, pretty good fight and they gave me a job off of it um and i ended up working and uh my boss uh was a really really good man he was a politician so there's gonna be two parts of the story now allegedly he assassinated another politician uh i got here yeah he upset he allegedly allegedly assassinated another politician that kind of put a little bit of a damper on things but he should be out soon uh what he had a deal <laughs> with sing pot the noon prison so i was a commentator so the prisoners would actually come and fight on our show. We had shows seven days a week. I worked four days a week. And uh, they would come and the CO would corner them. If they did well, they could get their freedom. Um, you had things like what's called prison fights where you could literally fight your way out of prison. Uh, you could, you know, there, there's a, there was a famous movie made and uh, so one of the guys in there, he had, you know, uh, killed a bunch of people, but then he lost prison fights. He was a teenager. He... They thought he threw a fight. So what the Thailand and Asian culture is called losing face. Uh, so nobody would deal with him. Uh, he kind of shamed. His family was shamed, everything. So he didn't know what to do. He had no way to make money. So he ended up becoming like a hitman for a mob. And so he ends up going to jail for several murders um, or assassinations. And he uh, he loses prison fight one year, wins it the next year, and then gets his freedom. I used to see him all the time. Nice guy. Became a mob. <laughs> He would actually corner another guy because one of our champions on 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 Max was a uh, a prisoner. He won on one of our we had called the weekday belts uh, for our global show, and uh, he eventually got his uh, his freedom. So you can fight your way out of. Prison. So it, 
if you're like one of the best fighters in the country, you basically have a get out of jail free card in your back pocket. You just- You'd be surprised how many good fighters there are. Now, now things are starting to change because now with the uh, uh, internet, social media, uh, it's a little harder now because before, yeah, you could uh, disappear somebody and uh, they, you know, the, the, the ball, most of when I say the term big boss, <clears throat> a lot of it is, for instance, when I was fighting in Lumpini, the original Lumpini, it's run by the military. So you can have no facial hair. Uh, mm. And it's really crazy. because Even if you were Muslim, you had to shave your, no matter what, you had to shave your face. There was no facial hair. Uh, if you had long hair, you had to cut it. You had to wear the shorts of the sponsor. The military ran. It was uh, military uh, uh, run, run by the generals. Uh, instead of like an athletic commission, there's a general that oversees the sport. But there's no... Uh, like nobody checks your hand wraps and and even in when I was fighting in Lumpini, uh mouthpieces were only they were only mandatory for round one. After that, you didn't have to wear it no more. So it's things have changed now. Even now things are getting uh uh softer. But yeah, if, uh uh I forget where I was going with this, but uh I don't yeah, know. you could essentially fight your way uh uh, uh out of prison. Um, we had a deal where, where the prisoners would actually come to us. So we would sing pot the new prison, the big, the boss of the show. Oh, I was saying about the boss, the big boss is like, uh, either it was a family owned gym or, uh, they were somehow military run. Like I know the, the founder, one of the gyms, uh, sit one child, uh, the brother is one of the big police chiefs. Um, the father was like, a a general great man, uh, uh, uh he was like 70, 80 years old, get up, would run around and serve. He was just like great shape. And, uh, um, yeah. So you're, it's, how can I say it? Like there's an element of underworld, but there's also, you know, which, which makes it kind of like cool a little bit, I guess. Um, but uh, it makes you, it really cool. You, you realize how absolutely absurd this sounds to a normal American. Right? Oh, really? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let me tell you like this. I, Without, without, okay, without saying anything, I worked and uh, uh, at a gym before with honest working people, support, you know, make their money legally. Biggest piece of shit scumbags I've ever met in my um, in my life. Unethical piece of shits. Drake, you might know what I'm talking about. We don't have to say no names. It's not less piece of piece of shit human beings. Piece of shit. And they're by all by all intents and purposes law-abiding citizens like this absolute piece of shit didn't have a set of balls between them between them right now in thailand i've been in camps where the guy was a gangster i worked for guys who are like i told you a story about the boss at max uh some of the most fair now we're talking about you know in turn of honorable to us to me to people i remember i wasn't trying to be a gangster so i wasn't in their world sure. i wanted to stay in my lane Never had a problem. Straight shooters told you exactly how it was and things like that. So there is a very interesting, you know, dynamic with with saying that. Sure. I never the honorable criminal. In a lot of ways, you'd be very surprised. I mean, if yeah. you talk, if you you, they like fighting. They understand that there's a sort of underworld component to it. Now, were they all gangsters? No, but I mean, if you were dealing, I've, I've dealt in situations where I've worked for them from there to 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 i mean i don't want to you know say too much but worked around a lot in, in in this fight world because there is a uh uh a, 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 a relationship between gangsters and and fighting it's always been even going back to the italian mob and boxing and sure push mob and i mean it's, it's always been there and I can say, you know, like, so that right there kind of says, we look at one side, like, like, they're politicians who should be in fucking jail. Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. I get what yeah, you're saying. I hear you. I hear you. Who should be in fucking jail for committing. Most of them should be in fucking jail. Right, for committing, you know what I mean, for, 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 for. for All the crime. shit that they do. Exactly. Now, I have, you know, so, we you know, what what is, you know, the laws change every day, you know, uh. Tomorrow, smoke a pass a law saying wearing a black and red shirt is illegal. I'm now, I'm now, I'm now become a criminal overnight. So what I'm saying is say that like, uh, 
it, it was an interesting thing working for those type of people and being a fighter for them because I've never, never had a problem with them. And in actuality, like for what's talking about the 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 boss of my show was a politician, not saying he was a, a, a gangster by any sorts, but um they treat you very fairly. I know for instance, for for one instance, when I actually uh I remember before my last fight, I had broke my arm in an underground fight. Um, I don't. I'm, 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 I guess I'll probably go into that story for you guys to give you another thing, which I think is normal. But there was a fighter where uh, the king had passed in Thailand, and so all fights had been canceled. And I was at a camp in Bangkok. I was training to uh, to to get a fight. Uh, I had a sponsor in Australia. He, he had sent me to this camp. Um, Australia has a very very high level of Muay Thai. And um, because they're in such close proximity to Thailand. Um, so he was sponsoring me and uh I went to the camp, I was in Bangkok training for uh for 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 a fight, uh ironically on the show Max Muay Thai, which I later ended up working for. And I remember when the king passed away, all fights in the country got shut down. I was running out of money. Uh just so happened someone said, Hey, there's an underground fight. Uh you know, do you want to take? I said, come on, man, I'm, I'm I'm on the way. So I had just enough money to go from Bangkok on like an 18 hour bus ride to the south to take the fight. And I remember breaking my arm or well, fracturing my my form in this fight. It was it was really funny because they were kind of like lining people up. They're like, ah, guys, smoke a cigarette. You and you, you come out. You and you, you come out. I'm looking at my guy like, man, this motherfucker's not in my weight class. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so. And a fraction. This is this is weird. It's like a curse almost. Five people on that night got their arm broke. I was a six fighter. I got my fraction. It was the weirdest thing. So I remember. Uh, and so later on, so fast forward, I go to where I'm working. At, uh, I'm gonna have my last fight at, at, at Max. So my arm uh, re refractured in the training. So I'm actually uh, uh, I don't want to pull out of the fight. I'm like, there's no way I'm pulling out. You know, because I didn't want my boss to lose face because, you know, they were a good, good, really nice family. And then they really took care of me. And I could see he like he felt bad. I was like, man, like, look, don't worry. You know, I'm taking this motherfucking fight, man. You know, we got to fucking uh, uh, duct tape this motherfucking arm. If this shit, if, the, if it pops out the bone, we just going to duct tape that shit and keep going. Um, and I remember going to see the boss to say face like the the, the, the boss of the, the promotion, Max, uh, and uh he said, he was like, look, don't worry. If your arm breaks or whatever happens, I'll pay for it. He's like, so fight with courage. And I went out there and I had a, a I think it was, you know, a, a, it was, a, I guess, impressive fight. I mean, a lot of people saw it. And he would do that for a lot of people. He would pay for guys. I know guys that would get injured, break their hand, or one guy, I know he got all his teeth knocked out. He would pay for this out of pocket. And that's awesome. So that's when I think about it. And that would be a lot of these guys that, you know, we would consider, you know, quote unquote, like I said, uh, maybe bad people. Sure. So I proud people to consider. But they, they you know, they're, they had a code, right? They had a code that they lived their life by. They have. I've come to realize sometimes these gangsters have more of a code than law abiding citizens. And I think back to the last gym or uh, to a gym I was working at uh, where uh, they were the most unethical pussy hearted people I've ever, ever met. I, un, un, unbelievable to me how they, how, how they could, uh, how they look themselves in the mirror to think that, damn, I've been around gangsters who had more of a, a sense of honor and integrity yep. while living in Southeast Asia. Sure. Yeah. The, the biggest thing that I'm pulling out of this, Kevin, is that when Drake does disappear, he's <laughs> in Thailand. We know where he's at. He's in Thailand. It's yeah. Thailand. He'll actually like it, Drake. You got to come over there because jujitsu, especially in the south now, Phuket, jujitsu is really starting to. Uh, it's becoming like an almost like a uh, a mecca now because when you have you know the, the climate is is great and uh, you're seeing a lot of jujitsu gyms pop up. I mean Phuket now. I'd say if South Florida is the mecca for MMA. Uh, Phuket, Thailand is the um, uh, the international uh, hot the hot spot for people to go train. All these MMA fighters are... Uh, remember uh, my buddy Phil Haas? Oh, I know Phil Haas. Yeah. Phil's... Uh, he's over there now. A lot yeah, of these, I heard that. A lot of these UFC guys are are, are, are are starting to go over there now. Your money goes a lot further. Your quality of life is better. You know, you, you know, obviously you're training. Uh, 
it's easy access for bodies and stuff like that. So the money that you actually make from your fighting, you can actually put away, invest and things like that. And let's just say for Thailand, if you if you do it right and provide you're getting training, it's not unheard of. You could live off of 12,000 for a year, could carry you for a year. Oh, That's shit. so insane. Maybe and, maybe we'll all move over there. Yeah, I mean, you might, might fuck you'll, around and move to Thailand. You'll live very, very well. I mean, and, and you know, you're talking about some of the most beautiful beaches. And the one thing, while I say all these other crazy, these, these other, the stories that you hear me say, and like, I mean, I didn't go too far down the rabbit hole for you guys with some of these stories because they go deep down. Um, but, <laughs> I'd uh, love to, love to. I gave the version as best I could. Um, the, the one beautiful thing about Thailand is that, and this is what I say, as a foreigner, if you get into problems with another tie, with a tie, it's 99.9% .9 your fault because the ties are very non-confrontational. They'll mm -hmm. they'll have their beefs or their things amongst each other, their whatever the game, whatever their things are. But for the most part, as long as you don't try and get involved in their world, uh, they're not running. Uh, for instance, I had an apartment and a uh, girl I was dating at the time, uh, I was back actually for one of Matt's camps. So I was thinking I was here for maybe six weeks. Uh, she left something on my on, on, on my door because she did, did she didn't realize what time I had left. She was she was away herself. So when she had got back, I had already I had already gone. Uh so she left something on my door and it was a pair of gloves, money, and like in in a in a bag. So it would have been on there for about five and a half weeks. When I came back, uh it was still there. Jeez, they, they don't there's a they, they, there's a certain uh uh code you're not gonna have people out here trying to rob you it's, it's it's a very very safe place um the one thing you have to understand is you have to at all points at all times you're surrounded by conflict meaning that uh in the north i think it's the northern part you're near the golden triangle which is considered the infamous golden triangle with the opium mm -hmm. and the heron um good and uh, Myanmar, which borders Myanmar, it used to be Burma when I was younger. It's now Myanmar. They have a conflict going on in the southern part of Thailand, uh, uh, which is northern Malaysia, southern Thailand. They have their own conflict because they want to be their own Islamic state. Um, oh, if, if you want, uh, I, I can go into a little story about that one. <laughs> Absolutely, hit us. I had a fight uh, called Thai fights, and it was in a place called Platani, Thailand, which is in that area I was talking about. So Malaysia's Islamic uh, 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 country, and that area uh, wants to be, uh, so northern Tha northern Malaysia, southern Thailand, they want to be their own sort of Islamic state, and uh, right. it's in the jungle. Beautiful place. So there was a the first time the show Thai fights. It was a huge show, real popular. Um, a lot of the best Thais versus foreigners are fighting on there. So I was golfing to fight on there. Never been down there before. And I remember there was no Air Force base. So we had to leave from the Royal Thai Air Force base on them like a military plane. When we And the people at the camp were always telling me, like, the Thai was like, oh, yeah, yeah, their bombs blow up all the time there. They like laughing. like, And it's funny. It's like, Thais don't have a word for extreme, right? So no matter what, it's always die. So if you're sick, they're like, oh, me think you die, sure. Like, everything is... If you're getting beat up bad, like, oh, why you die, man? Like, there's no word for extreme. It's just die. So <laughs> well, we flew on the plane. We get down there. They have the Humvees and you know, with the gun turrets and, you know, and then the vans. And then they have motorcycles circling us. And I remember going in there and uh, into the hotel. And I was like, man, I can't get any service. I had like a, a funny little, little, like a brick Nokia phone. I was like, I don't get any service. I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, we... Turned it off because, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, the other week, uh, somebody blew up a hotel and things like that. I was like, yo, what the fuck, man? So we fought in a soccer stadium. with It was like under a military thing. So you would see the signs we were riding. With, it was a hand with a circle around it and something right underneath of it. And what they were saying was, please stop the roadside bombings. And so we're in this. One of my favorite, most memorable experiences. I, I love going down there. Um, Where all it, the roadside bombings are happening. It was uh, in a soccer stadium. It was 55,000 people. It was a sea of people. And uh, yeah, I, I loved it. I felt unsafe as shit, but I loved it. I, I was trying to go back. It was, it was incredible. Um, 
So that was like Patani. So I was saying to say that at all times, Thailand surrounded my conflict. But inside of Thailand, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, peaceful in terms of, you know, as long as you, you know, act with, with, like anywhere else, if you act with respect to people and everything, you won't have any problems. It's also so like on the larger cool. scale things, there's conflict all over the country, but like on a, no, in a microchasm, you're walking down the street in the city, you're, you're going to be safe. Well, no, in the surrounding countries, they're conflict inside of there. You know, it's, it's relatively safe unless you're in the southern part, you know, but, you know, there are things that happen because, yes, like everywhere in the world there's gangsters, there's underworld, there's all that stuff. But, you know, for the most part, uh, it's uh, safe. Like I've been in two, two of the coups where they took over, the military took over. Um, didn't bother me. I mean, I, I didn't like I actually flew back into one of the coups, man, a fight. And then I remember his. Uh, uh, wife was saying like, oh, the news, there's a there's a coup in Thailand. What are you doing? What do you want to do? I said, look, man, is the fucking plane going to board? I said, then I'm gone. I'm going back. <laughs> and Holy remember, smokes. As long as they still allow fighting, man, that's all you need to know. I was like, I didn't give a fuck if they did allow fighting. And I was like, look, I'm going back to where the action is, man. That's my home. I'm flying back there. As long as the ball, I was like, my whole thing was, I just need to plane the land. Once it lands, I'll figure out the rest, man. I mean, I'll, I'll navigate my way through the rest of it. So would been, you... Would you feel safer walking down the street and most of the cities in, in Thailand versus like some of the rough areas in DC, Baltimore? Yes. And you mean in Thailand? Yeah. Yeah, because you, you I'm not concerned about getting robbed or the things like that or some stray bullet hit me in the head. Like, you know, over there, like I will say this, when there are certain gangster things that happen, they they pretty much they get who they need to get without going too far into it it's not going to be like a lot of running you so know, they got better gangsters over there is what you're telling us they're efficient <laughs> yeah if you're the target you're going they're going to get the target where here you know they're liable to, you know there's no aim these guys you know they're, they're, they're any they just shoot indiscriminately very sociopathic with uh uh with so I, I yeah i would feel much safer in asia the only place i felt nervous would have been the philippines and I love the Philippines. It's my favorite place to fight, to go. I love the Philippines. But in Manila, it can get a little... A little you sketchy. A little stay unsafe in certain places because they have so many guns down there. Uh, they make guns there. But in terms of everything else, Filipino people are some of the nicest people I've had. Uh, even though uh, some of my best story, craziest stories have been in the Philippines, like being extorted, uh, being on a plane with that... that uh, the engine blew up and had to make an emergency landing. Aside from that, I love the Philippines. <laughs> fucking love Brother, it. you've had some interesting life experiences. I gotta say. I man. Fucking you, Philippines, you, man. It is beautiful. You, you are not going to have many regrets when they put you in the ground. No, right? no, nah, nah, but that's the life I want to live. We only get to we only get to just go around this thing once here. So, Yo, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm low-key jealous, man. I, I'm low-key jealous of it. I, I, didn't, I think I, I think I got to go to the Philippines and, and, and Thailand and just spend some time over there. Go over there, man. I, look, there's nothing special about me. I'm a regular person. Anything I've done, anybody can do. Well, there's nothing special. It's 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 harder to do what you guys did, go, you know, than to do what I did. No, I don't know. No. For Drake, um, NFL, the, playing Division One. you know what I mean? It's, you know, it's just what I did is not that. It's not that difficult. You just have to have a... A, a, a good pair of balls and some heart and you can do it and, and a willingness it's a good uh, that's a good way to to live life i think I, I i know this you've given us a lot of your time tonight and and i i appreciate it a lot drake if you have anything else you want to bring up or, or talk about go for it otherwise dorian i told um, you that he was going to melt your guys' brain yeah we're going to have to have him back I, we're going to have to promise you like that you had series. i promised you that you had no idea what was coming and i fucking knew it Coach, you knocked it out of the park, man. The, you are about to you're about to gain a lot of fans out of the Midwest United States that you didn't know were coming because you just blew a lot of people's I'm minds. Midwest originally, she's from Columbus, Ohio. I love the Midwest. Yeah, it's a good place. And um, most of our fans ain't gonna love Columbus, Ohio, but we we will. Uh... Oh, the Hawkeyes don't like the Buckeyes, huh? No, <laughs> well, they don't much, like man. us as much, man. We shit it in their uh, Cheerios not too long ago. Yeah. Oh, really? Really? I'm well, they, to... they got us back. They, they got us yeah, back. They got yeah, us but back pretty they're good supposed life. to get us back. They've still not recovered from the one that we gave them. It's probably true. Um, bad recruiting year. Uh, we talking about football here because the wrestling is uh, kind of always neck and neck here. 
Yeah, Bash. yeah, that's that's a good wrestling ri- ma- rivalry too. Uh, yeah, probably, probably two of the top five uh, programs in the country. How's the football looking? Ohio State was always like uh, all the teams I remember coming up. It, it has shifted. So Our not- senior year, they came into Kinnick and we beat them 55-24. Wow! Hung a fifty burger on them. Nice. We caught we caught them on a on a hell of a day. Um, nowadays they they pretty much run the show in the Big Ten uh, and and always compete yeah, nationally. Been Michigan the last couple of years, but well, yeah. that's true. Are they in the Big Ten? They didn't move to the or no, the ACC teams moved to the Big Ten, right? Couple. Wasn't it Maryland? Yeah. Maryland and uh, Rutgers. Did, Rutgers. Yeah. Are they getting smoked? Because I always wondered how an ACC yes, team. They are. Yes, they are getting shitted on. Yeah, I would think they don't have the completely different game. They're not ready to handle that type of uh, uh, Big Ten type of game. Correct. Uh-huh. Correct. Um, there's probably about a thousand different directions that I could take this, but uh, I that's 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 my time for tonight. I, I we'll we'll have you back sometime, Dorian. This was fucking awesome. I try to keep it PG for you guys, and I hope I did. Job. Next it time was we'll phenomenal. Yeah. I was I was absolutely loving it watching these guys' reactions because I've heard some of these stories. Some of them were new stories, but I had the idea of what was coming, and uh, they had no idea. They just learned about a whole different side of Earth that none of them knew existed. And there's going to be thousands of people who are going to have the exact same experience. So very very much a pleasure to listen to that one. Thank you. I hope I hope I kept it humble enough, man. And, oh, uh, you you're fantastic pleasure meeting you and, and and thank you again for your time um you, for bro. everyone that listened the thousands of people drake just mentioned i i hope you had a and is as entertaining time that i did during this dude that and, was epic <laughs> and uh we will talk to you guys again on the next show um until then peace <laughs>